I'd just like to request that you guys uh, don't be too noisy so we can make sure we hear the speakers. The motion before us is this house believes that the U.S. should deprioritize maintaining its position as the dominant global power. With that, it is my honor to invite the Prime Minister to open the debate. Good morning, ladies and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the the government clearly stands that the United States of the United States of America should be the only political most influential state in the world that uh, should address all the or most of the important international issues on the on the international agenda. Well, but first we will try to explain some definitions in order to talk to this debate and then we're going to start uh, explaining our, our main arguments. First we're going to start uh, the, the defining by dominant political power. We understand dominant political power as the most politically, politically influential state in the world based on their geopolitical power. And another definition we want to address is the, the, the prioritization, which is the shift their priorities on the geopolitical coast and the, and the international agenda. So, what we the government really stand? We believe that not the U.S. should not be the only uh, most influential political power in the world. It is in the U.S. interest to empower other nations to uh, to, to to be to make them able to solve solve issues of the international agenda, speaking internally, regional, or global. We believe that it is. For, like, it is beneficial for the U.S. to relax, to, to give some power to other nations to solve the issue because what 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 was happening in the world? What happened in the world that if there is a big international issue, they they go to they go to the United States like okay we need your help. For example, we have a clear case, the case the recent case in Uganda with the with the rebel Kony. This is a clear example of why people they went to the United States government to tell them we need you to to help us to send some 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 uh, soldiers in order to capture these these uh, pernicious uh, uh, person in, in, in Uganda. The people want something uh, something to do, something to do about it, something about uh, international issues. Therefore, they came to the United, to the United States. So the United States uh, should uh, prioritize other international issues, like so other internal issues. So that's our main point. By empowering the other countries to solve their own problems, or by other countries to solve uh, some of the international agenda issues, they can focus more in the internal things. For example, education, healthcare, so uh, many social problems that the United States is facing right now. Uh, secondly, we believe that. Uh, that uh, the Western ideology must not try to, to be like the, the main the main uh, the main uh, guy in the world to, to history. We believe that in a globalized world, uh, it's beneficial for the international community to have like the vision of powers. And therefore, we can have like, many other examples. For example, in the United States, we can see that the country that uh, has most power in the United Nations, even though it's not a multilateral uh, organism. Uh, the most, uh, the, the dominant country in the United Nations is the United States. Why so? Because they are the first that they give the most, uh, uh, more money of, to the budget of the United Nations, and because they're also in the Security Council, uh, they're a member of the G5, which they have the power of the veto, and they, 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 they politically influence, uh, trying to, 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 well, I don't know, to influence the, the decisions taken in, in the, in that, in, in that organism. So we believe that, yeah. So, in the case of the United States being the global power and the, apparently the most strongest power in the UN, there's a government suggestion that the only way to deprioritize it is, as you said, give less money to the UN and back down from the UN? No, that's not the solution. We're just talking about giving less uh, money to the, to the United Nations in order to have less power. We believe, we firmly believe, that both, well, despite that we give more money, we give less money, all, people, uh, all countries in the United Nations will have like an equal treatment and an equal opportunity of expressing ideas and of, of political decision, not by having a power to be used to some countries and specifically the, the one that most thank you very much contribute to the to, to the budget. So uh, what uh, what we believe like well uh, like in the United States has like uh, has many other measures for example they control uh, like 
like they could they how they need legitimacy on their own people. So what they do like what they do is like for example in, in global issues, uh, let's say tourism, what they do is like well they need the, the their their internal citizens approval. So most of the people there in the in the in the United States, some of them they, they disagree with the with the foreign position. So what they do is an iteration of fear on them and we see the terror uh, the terror of the state against their population. We can see the case of on uh, 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 on after 9/11, when they start like establishing codes like uh, like red code or yellow code in order to establish fear in the population, and therefore it has the legitimization to go to Iraq, to go to Afghanistan, and for uh, geopolitical interests. So we believe that these practices should not be should, should be condemned. These practices should be available. And why we have like uh, uh, why we yes established? Uh, sir, why is it America's interest to actually uh, not prioritize this uh, role? Sorry? Why is it in America's interest to not maintain the strong global power in the world? The global interest is well, it's quite, it's quite uh, easy to rebut to, to, to answer this, this question. Like, okay, is it the United States uh, national interest? But what is the United, national, the United States national interest? We see that, well, for example, we see that double moral. They go, like, they go through democracy in, in, in North Africa, or they go in the Middle East, and they're saying, okay, let's bring, uh, let's bring Saddam Hussein down, let's bring Iraq down. But what, what happens with the other hand? Like, they're having, uh, like, the, the political alliance with Saudi Arabia, which is a which is a dictatorship, which is a family in, in, in power, which there's human rights violation. So yeah, when it's convenient to go to to, to a place, when it's not convenient, well, we we, we have some alliance. There are many other examples in the world. So what what the issue is like the United States should uh, the United States should uh, should empower it or at least like uh, give the chance to other countries to have some power to, to solve the most important international issues uh, because it's like it's, it's better for them to focus on their own internal issues and it's better for the international community. That's why we have so many protests like about reforming the United Nations. That's why because it is not fair and it's not fair for the international community and for other countries. So what we are saying is like we should we should be uh, prioritize the, the political power the U.S. has in the world. We should uh, encourage their, their citizens to know that uh, there are international organizations that they take care about international issues. So why the United States is the only country that can skip, for example, the United Nations uh, resolutions, security country resolutions, without having some sanctions and restrictions because they need the budget. That's what does correct the international community. So by all these reasons, uh, we, we, went to, we, went, we, we went to propose. Thank you. Yes. 
executives should be able to dictate every single other people, uh, country's uh, uh, opinion. Yes. The United States is, however, the only one that disobeys the United Nations without any, you know. Yeah. Okay. So, about the United States violating the UN conventions, we believe that human rights are violated by the United States. And if you're talking about specifically Afghanistan and those things that the government mentioned, sure, that was a failure of checks and balances, and the United Nations can step that up. But the, the thing that we're trying to say is that in the current status quo, the only Wait, alternative that the government, that the government is proposing, is that the United States deprioritizes them. We can see the clear impacts of that as we move on to the constructive. Now, the next thing he talked about was the idea of this whole, the Uganda rebellion, how, uh, and that we need to, uh, the, sorry, the, the, we need to prioritize more the domestic issues about education and healthcare. Now, the first thing we say to this is we believe that the United States obviously has an obligation to its citizens, and that we believe that it is being fulfilled. Just because the United States has prioritized and maintains position as the most dominant global power does not mean that the United States is completely ignoring its citizens. Uh, recently, we've seen the Obama health care plan. That, that was not that necessarily saying that we're going to completely ignore our citizens. The government, or nor the opposition, and nor does not have the burden to take the extremes here and say that the United States is going to be a tyrant, but the United States is going to be completely uh, uninvolved in international affairs. Well, what we cool. are saying, no thank you, is that the United States maintains its global position, maintains its dominant position, so that it can be, uh, it can be the arbiter, it can be basically the role model for other nations to come. Please sit down. Now, I'm going to move on to the constructive case of the opposition, which consists of two unique things that we said were the government burden, so it's also the opposition burden. First, we're going to show you why it's not in the U.S.'s interest to uh, deprioritize its position as maintaining a global power. And then second, I'm going to show the global interest and why globally it's not necessary or it's unnecessary, uh, it shouldn't be the, uh, the United States' interest to deprioritize this stance. Now, first, Let's move on to the political interest of the United States. We believe that any country is self-motivated. We admit that, that countries are self-interested, and that they're all, the only reason we have real global obligations, uh, realistically speaking, is because global obligations come back and benefit the United States. For example, we have treaties with other nations. We make the UN, we have coalitions, because, not because we are somehow benevolent and want to prosper the entire world, but because the United States recognizes that these type of coalitions, these type of organizations, help the United States back because we're guaranteed security, we're guaranteed aid and other things, etc. We want to look at it in a realistic perspective. Now, having said that, if we maintain our global position in the United States, we can actually, in a minute, we can actually uphold these type of coalitions, these type of treaties. We have the advantage to impact that type of terms. So we can maintain our power, we can maintain the peace with other people, and we can maintain the stance that although we are working and we are willing to work diplomatically with other nations, we still need to be reckoned with and we still are this force that, uh, that needs to be considered Yes. Do you believe that the United States can do a better job than the international institutions like the United Nations to assure international security? Once again, just because the United States is the most dominant global power does not mean that the United States is going to override the UN and start deciding international conflicts for the UN. I'll uh, place it down. So, uh, moving on. Now, another thing that we want to talk about is if the United States does not maintain its global power, what exactly is going to happen? Now, the government has provided this unclear uh, assumption that once the United States starts deprioritizing and saying, look, we're not going to maintain this position of dominant global power, that suddenly uh, uh, all these other countries are going to be like, okay, let's all hug together and uh, make a perfect coalition. Again, we want to be realistic here. Who's the next power after the United States? We ask everyone in this audience. I think we have one word in mind, China. We believe that if the United States starts to deprioritize maintaining its global power, then the next country to step up and say, hey, it's our turn now, is China. Now, we see several problems with this issue. Now, we're not saying that China's a bad country overall. We're not saying that everything that China does is bad. However, we can see that if you want to, we can turn the argument that they say that the United States has all these violations, so we do admit it's bad. And then you look at China, the other available option, and you look at the situation in China, the, the domestic crimes, oh, the international crimes, uh, uh, the problems. You look at China's relations with undiplomatic countries and how they support countries like uh, that are undiplomatic just because of the fact, uh, just because of the ideology of their economic interests. I'll take David. How do you think it's going to affect the international cooperation when we always have countries which, are, which have supremacy, which always oppose each other? Okay. Countries will always oppose each other no matter what the United States is a global power or not. We're not saying that, and in fact, this is another reason this is moving on to our second argument about how the United States needs to be a role model to secure that these conflicts are secured and done in a peaceful manner. Now, if we see that global security is something that we all want to uphold. 
symbol. Now, imagine what would happen if the United States decides to basically step down from the symbol of the United States government power, the arbiter of democracy, the protector of democracy is basically what the United States stands for. Then, we still, we, we think that this, uh, this uh, poses a threat to not only the security of the United States because people will look down, uh, people will look at the United States as stepping down in power, but more importantly, global security as well. Because if you think of the terrorist organizations, if you think of the uh, organizations like al Qaeda, what will they think? They will think that, okay, the United States has stepped down as a, as, a, as a political power because the war on terror has largely been the U.S. plus its allies against terrorists. It has been a global effort, but we still believe that the United States to firmly stand as the leader of this type of war, of this, of this engagement, even though there are international checks and balances. And this moves on to the final thing, which will be elaborated later by my partner, about the idea of the United States as a symbol for both economic and uh, role model for democracy. The idea that the United States is basically this type of symbol of democracy, the idea that the United States stands for this role model, and it is not in the interest for the United States to deprioritize maintaining this position. That's not only in the interest for the United States, which has been completely unaddressed by the government, but more importantly, for the global nation, uh, global world. <laughs> Hi, is this okay? Yeah? All right. So, they have said that the United States must be a role model. We will tell you today on site government, as we have before, that the teacher is most successful when it is surpassed by the student. Now, I'm going on to refute a few of the points presented by the previous speaker, and then I will go on to reinforce what my, what my partner has already stated about how it is in the U.S. best interest and how the U.S. Has, needs new priorities, what these new priorities are, and how that relates to the global community. But first, let's go back to what we have heard. We have heard a case in which the USA is pretty much perfect. We would like to argue that that's not the case, and that there's pretty significant evidence that that is not a case. They have said that the US must be the leading role model in economics. However, blockades on Wall Street are probably a very good sign that not everything is working perfectly. Now, they have accused us of saying that the US should be completely uninvolved in international issues. However, what we're stating and what the motion is stating is that they should deprioritize the fact that they want to maintain themselves as the only global political power. Now, we consider that that is not in the interest of the United States or of the international community, but I will get further into that when I get into my substantive. So, who... <laughs> Okay, they have said that if the US steps down, China will step up. Now, we don't see this as the main issue of the debate. However, we have stated that one of the priorities that the US should have now is to empower other countries, other Western democratic countries, so that they will be the ones that take the lead. No, thank you. That they should prioritize not only that, but that they should prioritize certain internal issues that have yet to be addressed. Even with the Obama bill on uh, healthcare, there's still plenty of issues within the United States that need to be addressed, such as, for example, failure to succeed within the educational system of many of their students. No, thank you. So we believe inside government that both the US and the international community would benefit from a more level playground, one in which accountability for everything that happens in the world does not fall only on the USA. We have seen this in the case of Coney 2012, which was an initi a civil-led initiative to force the United States to, to have a military intervention in Uganda and in the related region so that they could take out uh, um, a rebel group led by a man named Kony. We believe that in a world where there's more than one dominant global, global dominant political power, we will have other nations that will be able to take accountability for things that happened in the world, so that it's not only up to the USA to be the one force that always has to take care of everyone else in the world. Yes? Okay, so if you're saying that we need to put accountability to other nations and put power to other nations, don't you have to defend the fact that then those nations that we're powering are somehow perfect and the United States is the only one that has some type of problems in their own country? Well, if there is, n there is no one perfect country in the world, which is why we think that political power on a global level should be shared by countries that are more or less functional. <laughs> 
including the USA, but shared power. So we're saying here, as, my, as the previous speaker stated, that it is in the US best interest, because now there won't be only one country that is accountable for every anti-democratic initiative in the world. Because whenever something anti-democratic is going on in the world, everyone turns to the USA for them to be the ones that have to go to war, that have to spend their resources, that have to spend the lives of their citizens. Why not the UN? Why not a different nation? Why not some other place that has to take responsibility when human rights are being wronged in the world? We believe that the new priorities of the USA should focus both on empowering other nations so that they don't have to step up to the plate as often as they now do, but not, you know, totally become uninvolved in international issues which would be impossible because no country is an island and also to prioritize internal issues that have not been prioritized, such as, for example, the fact that mo with many initiatives of the USA, there's a huge portion of the country that is not satisfied with how they're dealing with their international issues. So we believe that it is in the best interest of the USA to reduce, for example, the instances in which they have to use fear upon their citizens in order to legitimate some sort of measure. Yes. Could you please prove to the opposition and the audience and the judges how prioritizing maintaining global power somehow made the United States ignore these problems? We see that in the current state of the status quo, the USA is the one that everyone turns to. The USA is the one that has to spend not only their resources, but that has to lose the legitimacy in front of a huge amount of their population whenever they have to go into another nation and intervene, whenever they have to change things in another nation. So we believe that the fact that the, cit that the citizens are not satisfied with how the USA is dealing with its international relations is actually detrimental to how they would be able to deal with things like education or like healthcare. Because if you don't have the support of your citizens, it's much, it's much harder to do these things. So we believe that these are the new priorities and they influence the world in the sense that yes, there is now in place a, uh, a system of checks and balances that has been proved to be very failable as they have you know, agreed to. This system of checks and balances in which there is one global dominant political power is not working. The status quo is not working because the USA is the one that everyone turns to and is the one that also feels in the moral obligation of being the one to intervene in these situations. Now we believe that the USA should see, empower other nations so that there is accountability in other nations. So that other nations are able to solve not only their own problems but also to intervene in the case of international and regional issues. We believe that this will make for a better global community, for a more a level playing field in which there are different powers and in which discussion can be had and there isn't just one global dominant political power that is the only one that can go against the United Nations decree to not enter a country and have absolutely no sanctions whatsoever in that instance. So we believe that these new priorities will lead to a more level playing field within the world and they will also allow the US a, a time to redo their relations with their citizens in a different context. It is for these reasons that we believe that the USA must approach this in this way, that the USA must empower other nations and that the USA must prioritize this and not their own becoming a political power, maintaining political power. <laughs> Thank you. We now welcome the Deputy Leader of Opposition. We don't want to make little America all over the world. We're not saying that America is perfect and we're not saying that every policy that it has is always 100% effective. We want to show you how if America maintains the role of staying the most dominant power in the world, it actually can be a role model for all of the other countries in the world. It can actually show the other countries how to follow into her steps and become much more better. So basically, uh, 
the, op the proposition te uh, team came today and said uh, that there are domestic issues in America which America is not trying to solve. Well, that is not true. Yes, there have been protests. Yes, some of the citizens have not been satisfied. But ladies and gentlemen, that is the primary idea of democracy. You have your citizens to tell you whether they want something or whether they do not like it. And that is how when you interact with your citizens, you make a proper and optimal decision for your country. We can't say that protests are bad thing. We're actually happy to have this protest and we're actually happy to have the people's voice heard, unlike in other countries, like for example China, which is, which is obviously going to be the second power which, which will step in if America backs out and I'm going to elaborate on it later. So basically the proposition team is uh, telling us stories how they want to have an equal share with the world and how all of the countries are going to be equal. Well that is perfect but it is a utopian scenario and unfortunately that is not reality. I think that it is common sense that we can all agree that there's always going to be one most powerful country in the world. When the Soviet, uh, when the Soviet Union existed that was Russia. Now America is the one and we're going to prove to you why it should actually stay. If America steps out, uh, out of the power we can basically assume that the second one most powerful country is going to step in in her shoes and currently that is China. So let's look at the other option that we have if America steps out and the impact if this happens. We can see China where people's rights are not being heard. Yes, there, there maybe there, are not, there aren't protests in there but that is because the people do not have the right to protest. So basically we can say that we are happy to have them protesting and we're happy to have them uh, giving uh, to give them these rights. Uh, the next thing that they were talking about is how uh, America should actually prioritize domestic issues. What we say, these two things are not mutually exclusive. When you care about the global situation in the world, that does not mean that you're not doing anything for your citizens. We can actually see how this international power that it has actually helps her to then uh, use this power and actually help uh, to solve their domestic problems. Because as Brian has explained to you in a second, they have treaties, they have coalitions with other countries, and they're in such an optimal condition that they can actually use this power to help and solve their domestic issues within their borders. Yes, please. Uh, so would you agree that uh, the U.S. is a dominant power to make a world a better place? Uh, no, we're believing that, that we are not believing that the United States is kind of a superhero which goes everywhere and always solves every problem. We believe that if the United States actually maintain, maintain their role as a dominant power, they can show the world what a, what a country should actually look like. And I'm going to elaborate on that later. Uh, then there was uh, uh, there was the example about the Coney protests, etc. Well, basically, the, United, the, the citizens in the United States had actually the incentive to, uh, to, uh, to try to solve the problem in Uganda. And if the United States did not have the option to do so, if they needed this power for anything else, obviously that they wouldn't use it. But since the, the, they had the power to do so, and they tried to solve the problem, and they tried to catch somebody who abducted children, who forced them to, uh, who forced them to fight in the military, we cannot see how this is actually a bad thing. The, uh, the, the citizen showed the incentive, the America had the possibility to help so and that's what it did. And we cannot see how this is actually uh, a problem in this world. So uh, basically another thing that we would like to mention is that America is not the only power which currently reacts on situations in the world. We can also see the UN Security Council uh, react, we can also see other international organizations react. America is not the superhero in the world which always, always goes by themselves there. We can say that actually the Americans are those who, who when they have, uh, they're basically, they're not solving every single issue in the world. They're just, they're not the only political power in the world. They're just the most political, the most influential political power. Yeah. Do you see when you say America is America? Is that where you see the ideology you have? America is a continent with 32 more countries than the United States. And that's the The context of this debate, even when you were sp speaking about it, was the American, and I think that we can all agree that you understand what I mean when I say America. I don't think that that is a relevant issue in this debate, but anyway, thank you for the question. Uh, the next thing that I would uh, like to talk about is actually elaborate how, if you believe that your values are good, you have every right to try to promote them to other people. You don't have the right to force these values to other people, but yes, you can try to do everything that you can in order to promote these values. 
And since the, we can see how the Americans actually respect the liberties of the people, how they actually give the people the right, the basic human rights that they exist, how there are checks and balances for all of this, how they believe that they are the ones who are actually promoting these democratic values. If you believe that your values are good, you can try to promote those values. And what a better way to do so if you are the most dominant global power in the world. So basically, we have shown you how actually the Americans have the incentive to still prioritize this thing, while on the other hand, the government team has never ever actually told you why it is in America's interest to deprioritize this maintaining of the role as the global power in the world. We can also see how actually even in the economy sphere, America is really successful because they have the liberal capitalism, which is actually giving all of the people the equal opportunity to, to participate in the market. We have, uh, again, we have these rights, democratic approaches, we have uh competition, innovation, and stuff like that. Well, on the other hand, if we compare it to China, where we have actually the state capitalism, which is not so efficient, we can see that even in, in, in the economy sphere, they are much better than the second option that is going to take all the world if they step down. Also, we have, uh, for example, we have seen how in the last six months, actually the economy in China has significantly de decreased, and how they're actually trying to ask for expertise help for the Americans. So if the second option is trying to help, uh, is asking for help, from the current uh, uh, from the current country who is the most dominant in the power we can conclude that actually it has every right to do so so both, uh, because we have shown you how the americans for themselves have been sent to stay the most uh, the most influential global power and how it would be better also for the world while on the other hand the government team has uh, shown you uh, none of this i beg you to oppose the motion thank you very much to the entire opening half we now proceed Ladies and gentlemen, throughout the opposition speeches, they have conceded to the fact that the United States seeks to be a dominant power to eventually make the world a better place. Ladies and gentlemen, in the first speech, they've said that the United States must maintain its role as a role model in the world. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we see a burden of proof here is to, is to say whether uh, the United States being a dominant power makes the world a better place or not, ladies and gentlemen. And if they don't, ladies and gentlemen, it's something they should not strive for because it's their ultimate goal in the world. Um, they've also said, since it's a role model, it has to be very consistent. It has to provide human rights for every other person in the world. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we would also like to, in our constructive, show you on how this inconsistency of the United States is actually polarizing the world. But before I do that, I would like to move on to our rebuttal of their case. So ladies and gentlemen, first of all, they said, well, they can still abide by the rule of uh, the United Nations and their checks and balances, and they provided us uh, they provided us with an example of where these checks and balances don't work, ladies and gentlemen, and they provided us an example with Afghanistan, ladies and gentlemen. So we believe even one such case is so detrimental. This is not human error. This is not some sort of operation where you might kill one person, ladies and gentlemen. This is a war that can take tens and uh, can take decades or uh, several years, no thank you, that could result in many casualties, and we cannot accept even one such instance, ladies and gentlemen. But what we see in reality is that there are more instances. Instances. There was the Iraq war, there was their support of Gaddafi, there was their support of a coup in Iran that was undemocratic, ladies and gentlemen, and we see that there are so many instances on where these checks and balances fail, and that the United Nations actually is delegitimized in the process, uh, being unable to do anything. So, um, um, on their first point, they said, well, it's in the United, uh, it's in the United States interest too, uh, because they get a lot of allies. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we also see this isn't mutually exclusive. Exclusive. If they deprioritize themselves as a dominant power, they could still be in these alliances. They could still trade with other countries. What we're saying is that we don't need this one uh, country in the world to say what is wrong, what is right, paint other countries as being morally incorrect, and going in under that pretext being inconsistent. Um, they, uh, no, thank you. They also said they, uh, that it would never override whatever the UN does. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we see, and you've provided us with examples where it does, and, and we also see that it actually prompts other countries to be hostile towards the United uh, States and work against them because they are painted by the United States as dictatorships or people who do not respect uh, human rights that uh 
Um, and then they also said, uh, no, thank you. They also said, well, it's, uh, it's good because uh, the United States has liberal capitalism. China has state capitalism. We can't allow that. We've never seen any el elaboration on why, is that, why that's not working. We see that state capitalism is, in China is actually working pretty fine. It's the second economy. And we don't see that a capitalistic form uh, over another could be somehow better or a pretext to go into other countries in a second and uh, somehow delegitimize their governments. Yes, please. Okay, so besides state capitalism, how about the enormous amounts of human rights violations that are incomparable to what the United States is doing in the status quo of China? Well, I'm going to talk about that in my constructive uh, afterwards. Uh, but what also that you said that globally, China will be a global power. So first of all, we see that it's not mutually exclusive. China is seeking to be a global power in this reality when the United States is trying to be that. But what we see if the United States is no longer trying to somehow intimidate China by saying, we're the dominant power, not going to let you to do something. We see this resemble as the Cold War. It's almost like a nuclear arms race. Because the United States is going into Vietnam, is going into the Indian Ocean, saying that China cannot do anything, uh, cannot do anything they want, China actually has an incentive. It's afraid, and it, this polarizes the world. And that's why I would like to move into our constructive material on how uh, the inconsistency of the United States polarizes the world. So first of all, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it, what the United States does in this world is they promote this one value of democracy. They say that other democratic, uh, other undemocratic countries or whatever they say is undemocratic is wrong. And we don't believe in such a progressive world that we should have this one ideology being run. We see that China does limit freedom of speech and all of that, but we see that China has reasons for doing it because they believe national security and economic improvement is a lot better. You've never actually explained us on why that is completely more morally incorrect. You've never actually explained us on what are the implications if China is the next global power. And no, thank you. Um, and then we also see that because uh, the United States paints China as this very evil country, we see we see the United Nations, go, uh, the United States, going into Vietnam, implementing military bases, completely destabilizing the region, making China even more hostile because it's trying to become the more dominant power. The United States is trying to become a more dominant power. We see that China actually gets a reason to defend itself. China gets a reason to further uh, neglect its human rights to uh, for national security and we believe that is not the correct this uh, and there is a clear example of how this actually backlashes in the United States for example the currency wars the uh no, thank you. When China inflated its currency just so it would get an unfair advantage, and the United States, the United States tried doing something about it, but because uh, China is turned hostile towards the United States so much by the United States international policies, it never actually worked. Um, no, thank you. We also see that uh, there is an inconsistency, something that you need to prove that the United States, as a role model, needs to be consistent in order to make the world a better place. So we see that the United States essentially is trying to provide human rights for uh, people outside their countries. But what we see they're doing is they're trying to do it through de neglecting their human rights. They're going into wars, resulting in many casualties. Uh, one such, uh, two such examples, for example, the Iraq War, uh, the, uh, the war in Afghanistan. We also see the United States uh, supporting Israel over Palestine, giving Israel an unfair advantage. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we see Israel as the one state that has torture, that goes uh, morally on a completely le uh, different level than the United, Na than the United States, and it's completely uh, and if we believe this is a completely uh, inconsistent sense, something that they themselves said that they need to prove because the United States needs to remain a role model in the world. We see the United States uh, supporting Gaddafi and Mubarak before they broke down on their people because they wanted this security. And ladies and gentlemen, if the United States is doing all of this for only personal interests, not making a, the world a better place, we believe that uh, we, should, uh, uh, we should not let the United States be the most, legit, uh, the most dominant power in the world because it actually does not make the world a better place. It's only acting in self-interest that in the end even backlashes against the United uh, States. So for all these reasons, we beg you to propose the motion. Thank you very much. We now welcome the member of opposition to extend the opposition's case. Ready? We are still afraid of China, 
and this is why we still oppose the motion. We want to talk about firstly why it is particularly harmful for the U.S. to focus, uh, why it's particularly harmful for the U.S. to focus actively deprioritizing their position on global affairs, and secondly why China is very scary and why the U.S. is better in international relations in terms of why we should regard diplomacy over the types of measures that China would or wouldn't use in terms of international political affairs. But before that, points of rebuttal against their case of the uh, member of the government. Firstly, they said that the United States, or we have the burden to prove that the United States makes a better place because if it doesn't, then the United States should automatically deprioritize its maintaining its power. We believe that that's a very, uh, that, that in itself is a, abusive uh, burden to be placed because if we don't, if we, uh, there are going to be wrong things as we have admitted in the opening half that the United States does, but that does not justify the fact that they should deprioritize all of its political influence in the global arena. Pri uh, particularly the examples they provide about how we uh, engage war in Afghanistan and in the war in Iraq. First of all, these wars uh, many consider, some people actually consider as legitimate. For example, the war in Afghanistan. Why did we invade Afghanistan? Because the attack, for example, the, the people who were harboring the terrorists that attacked night, or the Twin Towers were being hidden in Afghanistan. And why did we attack Iraq, for example? Because Saddam Hussein were gassing the Kurds and creating mass violations of human rights. We see that the United States doesn't just put people in power to revolt, and no thank you, people, it doesn't kill off people on the basis that they want people that they actually choose. Sometimes when we realize that certain governments are doing wrong things like we did in Iraq when Saddam Hussein actually did gas the Kurds, we say that, that those types of people need to be stopped. And that's exactly what the United States does when it's in the position of, the, of maintaining global, global power, which is something that other governments wouldn't be able to do on the basis that they are not accountable to the international community as much as the United States is. Secondly, they say that China is not so scary because they do things and the fact that they do things differently doesn't justify, doesn't de-justify their way of doing things. And they said that they prioritize national security over human rights, so it's okay. Okay, well, abusing Tibetans in China is a matter of promoting national security? Obviously not. These types of abuses are not simply just to promote national security. We see that there are abuses in China that occur with that, regardless of the fact that they want to promote national security. There are just simple abuses on the basis of the fact that they are not accountable to the people. Why? Because, first, first of all, they're not ruled by a democratic uh, ideology, and that's exactly what we want to talk about next, after I talk about why it's particularly harmful for the U.S. to actively deprioritize. So you're talking about Gaddafi and... Uh, uh well, why you haven't do anything against the royal Saudi family and why you have military agreements with Saudi Arabia? Okay, I'll talk about that in my when I talk about how bad China is. But first of all, I'd like to talk about why it's particularly harmful for the U.S. to focus on actively deprioritizing uh, the position on global powers. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about the fact that it's actually a supporter of co collective security. This means that an extension of the fact that the U.S. actually promotes security for other nations, they provide the example of Israel and how the fact the U.S. is actually supporting Israel and that is bad because they're not siding with the Palestinians. No, we're saying that Israel has has been attacked for, for example, in the Seven Day War and the Yom Kippur War previous times. And the fact is, we maintain a check so that don't, no conflicts come out. It's not like we really like Israel and we want to support them because we really love them. No, it's because we don't want conflicts to arrive in, arise in the, in the Middle Eastern area. This is exactly what the U.S. is doing. It provides a check so that military conflicts don't arise. We're saying that those types of diplomacy and those types of treaties are actually good for the, uh, for the international affairs so that conflicts don't arise in this case and more innocent people die. Secondly, another example of how this collective security is actually useful is the fact that the United States, because it is the most uh, is the most powerful country in the world, it can pr protect countries like South Korea, who are very uh, who are on the verge, for example, of um, North Korea of attacking South Korea. It's very tenuous agreement of uh, military armistice. So we say that the United States is actually good in securing the tenuous relationships that uncertain countries have. Sure. So they would still be allies with South Korea. You are inclined to protect your allies. We're saying it wouldn't be the global policemen going into other countries that they have no business. Okay, well, regardless of the fact is that uh, I just mentioned the fact that because the United States is a global power, it prevents nations that may have otherwise attacked a weaker nation from doing so in the first place. And that's exactly what we're talking about in terms of uh, maintaining the se collective security. Secondly, now we're going to talk about why China is so scary and the fact that we need to provide extensive analysis on why we shouldn't allow China and why China would, in fact, uh, bring the, uh, have, be the next political power in the first place. We see that every time a global power falls, there is a new power. We saw this before World War II when the UK and France were global powers. The United States rose to power. It's called the power vacuum. When there is no state in the government or in the world that doesn't have a particular power, nations are going to try to rush in to get that power in the first place. And we see that China is probably the most viable option for that, to take that spot in the first place. And we say that this is particularly bad because, first of all, they're not democratic. And we're not saying that democracies are bad in general, but uh, China in, in particular does not have a respect for the human rights or the, the, the codes that are set up by the international treaties. So they don't have, a, they don't feel the moral obligation 
nation to going and intervening in countries, for example, in Iraq, where they gas Kurds or they kill mass amounts of innocent people. They don't do that because they themselves do that in their own country. And they don't feel that they have a need or an obligation to do those things. And we say that the U.S. does have an obligation. That's the major difference between the liberal democracy of the United States and the fact that China might be in power. Second thing, China, China actually... This is where I'm going to address the Saudi Arabia point. The fact is that uh, China, for example, supports countries, rogue countries like North Korea, Iran, and Myanmar that do violate human rights, and we have no possible way of telling China to stop doing that. And the fact is that Chinese people, the Chinese people can't even stop doing that because the opening half mentioned very briefly the fact that they can't protest. If they do, they're probably going to be killed or they're going to be violated, their human rights are going to be violated. But in the United States, if we, for example, uh, disagree with the things that are occurring in Saudi Arabia, the United States people can say, look, stop trading with Saudi Arabia or start doing things to to try to stop the abuses that are occurring in Saudi Arabia. But those types of things are not possible in China because of the fact that they don't have that type of particular moral obligation to do so as much as the United States does. Sure. Okay, so, you, so if, the, if the Saudi Arabian family is like, is pernicious, why do you keep making deals with them? I just said, if we disagree with the things that occur with Saudi Arabia, the United States people have an obligation or even they, they have the ability to make the United States realize that the things they're doing with Saudi Arabia is wrong. And we can do those types of things. Like, for example, we impose embargoes on Cuba because of the violations of human rights that occurred in Cuba. We say that the United States people are the checks and balances that occur within the, within the United States government to prevent them from doing stupid things that, uh, that may cause further human rights violations. Their only, their only point in this case is the fact that, okay, the United States intervenes too much or meddles too much in the international arena in regards to trying to promote democracy. But they never actually provided for why this is a bad thing. We say that promoting democracy in a certain sense may be better than supporting the dictatorship regimes that are occurring in this world and maybe replace those regimes that violate the human rights with a better form of democracy. And we say that this is inherently better because we can create more accountability within the government, more transparency with the government, and provide governments that actually be checked by the people, much like the United States can be checked by its own people. And for all these reasons, we beg you to oppose. Thank you. Thank you. We now welcome the last speaker on the government bench. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, the opposition has portrayed a quite naive picture of the United States for us. It's kind of like stating that it's that angel of democracy, providing human rights for every dying child. We say that that is not the status quo. That is not something that actually the United States is. And we're going to say, and we're going to clear up this debate by saying, what is our motives? What is our United States motive? And how can we actually get a better world? So we say that why actually the United States is not the role model of democracy? Well, we have several reasons to say that. First of all, for supporting Israel in every unlawful activity concerning exploiting the citizens of Palestine, right? They said that, well, kind of Palestine has done some things wrong. Well, yeah, in the, by the international community, we condemn them. But the problem is that the United States never condemns Israel. It never says that it does anything wrong. And we say that that cannot be the, actually the role model of democracy. Moreover, we say that it has, uh, for instance, the close economical ties with Gaddafi before the Arab Spring, which means that it always doesn't prioritize democracy and human rights over actual economical ties, which is exactly the same thing that China does. For, uh, moreover, we say that uh, but intermediate military with Iraq is exactly saying how it does not follow the mandate of the United Nations. We're saying it actually hampers the process we want to provide human rights for people. So we say that the op opposition agreed with us that uh, that they are that the United Nations, the United States, um, these kind of actions are done by self-interest. That is something what the first opposition said, and we said that that is a problem. That is not something that we support on the proposition side because we think that the global supremacy sh supremacy should be cooperation. It actually should be the United States which has checks and balances because they say that one country always has self-interest, one country always does some things wrong. Don't you agree with me? Uh, no, I don't, since you never address the point that there's always going to be a leading power and that if America backs down, China is going to be that one. Uh, can you please explain to us how China is a better option than America? No, we don't say you have to have to choose China. We say you have to choose international cooperation. We actually say that you have to choose debate over choosing one country, saying what is wrong and what is right. No, thank you, sit down. Okay, so I have two constructive arguments in my case. First of all, I'm going to talk about the polarization of the world, and second, I'm going to talk, talk about the moral inconsistency and actually how this one global supremacy, one global police is going to hamper our fight providing people human rights. So, okay, talk about polarization of the world. So the first opposition had this 
idea that the United States is the role, uh, role model for every democratic state. We say that no, we, we don't like countries which will not, do, we don't like countries which override the UN mandate because we kind of have these fixed ideas what is right and what is wrong. We say that there is some room to debate, but we actually understand that every country should actually support human rights, every country should support uh, international law. We say that we understand that actually there is a need for checks and balances, but right now, actually, the United States does not have them because it has more power actually than the United States, because than the United Nations, because it's all constantly overriding the mandate. It's constantly having its own self-interest. Now we said it's a bad, and which is a bad, it's, it's a big problem. Now there's a question: How can we actually get a better world? We say which world is better? If the United States is a supremacy, if it's not, we say that the, we get a better world if actually we do it through international cooperation. Something that Justin really clear, clearly developed for you. We say that there are actually different ideologies. We say if we say to that, we say that there is the state capitalism. We say that there is this, uh, uh, this uh, private capi capitalism, and we say that it is okay. Again, we say that if there is a violation of human rights, we are going to condemn that it's okay. Sit down, and we say that. But there is a difference here because the United States is constantly being hypocritical. It says it, it has the self-interest to gain motivation and to actually be oppose this kind of certain countries to economical reasons, to, to kind of self-motivations. And we say that is bad because what this is actually doing is that it's creating opposition in the world. It is creating the polarization of countries. It is saying that we should always oppose each other. Now, where comes it in? What is the problem here? It's the fact that actually China wouldn't gain and wouldn't have that motivation to be this global superpower if it wouldn't have a country to always oppose it, right? Because, for instance, if we wouldn't have actually, for instance, United States who would strategically place all its naval bases in the Indian Ocean in order to oppose China, for instance, then China wouldn't also arm its country that much. We say that it's going constantly creating the situation where, it, where it's creating the situation of self-defense. It's constantly creating the situation for countries where they have to oppose each other in in order to win something. And we say that that is a game, and that is constantly hampering our cooperation and what we actually want to achieve. We say that it's hampering the activities of the United Nations also, because it's saying that, well, since we have these two enemies, we can never decide anything in the Security Council, right? Sit down. And we say that that is also a problem, because, for instance, if those countries would cooperate and wouldn't oppose each other so much in order to beat this global police or global supremacy, well, we could actually decide something upon what we'll do with Syria, right? So we say that it's going to hamper the things we want to achieve in Security Council, and that is bad. So we say that it's going to polarize this, these countries, it's going to polarize this world, because everyone wants to oppose each other, and that is bad. Okay, moving on to another argument, which is the moral inconsistency. Now, we kind of have figured out what we want to achieve in this world. How, what does the perfect, perfect world <coughs> look like? And that, uh, that is a really inane and silly thing, because actually that is not the real world, right? But we still have this idea. The fact that we want that every country would appreciate human rights, would actually allow freedom of expression, etc. And we said that right now it's not happening. But there is a big contradiction in that case. <coughs> Because they say that the only way we can actually provide and get access to that world is the fact that we have that one global police, is the fact that the, that the United States is that global police. And we say that is a contradiction, because we still have other kind of checks and balances, for instance, again, the United Nations, for instance, NATO, and other just kind of allies. We say that we don't need one just kind of hypocritical country to, to, to demand other, other countries to do anything. And we say that if they, again, brought China, I mean, for instance, we have checks and balances for China again, but but the fact is that why do they have to actually support war? Why do they actually have to provide arms to each other to get to the war? And we say that there is a big problem on the ideological level because when the United States is being hypocritical and actually saying that, oh, we provide human rights, we're that good, we're that awesome, we're the role model of the, I don't know, democracy, we say that, well, it is not that. And other countries understand that it's not that. So the problem here comes. How can we actually say that this is the role model? You should do that if the United States is constantly being hypocritical and also not obeying these kind of laws. And where is it that is exact problem? Because it does not actually create the situation where we say that we have those fixed things and we have those ideas that we want to support. So an ideological level, it's gaining more opposition. We have the uh, example of war and terror, etc. Right. So because of those reasons, we believe that again, this moral inconsistency is providing hypocrisy for the world. So dear ladies and gentlemen, I beg you to propose. Thank you. Thank you. And we now invite the last speaker of the debate.
We see that the status quo is not perfect. We know that the US is not necessarily you know, the angel, or the protector of democracy, but we know that it's not perfect. But although we do affirm this, we say that it is far better than any other alternative. Okay, please note. So that is why we beg to oppose. So before I get on to my points, I'd like to offer three points of re four points of rebuttal to what my previous speaker said. So the first point, a case rebuttal. They told us that the US does not condemn Iraq. The fact is this is inherently false. It does. When Benjamin Netanyahu built buildings in areas which were strictly prohibited because they were bordered by other islands, the US did actively go in and condemn them. Secondly, the case that, that uh, they told us that the power should be in the international community's hands and not just in the US's hands. We have two things to say to this. Firstly, we don't affirm that the US has all the global power. So when intervention did happen in Libya, it was not the US that did it, it was the NATO that did it. But secondly, even in the alternative situation, even if the US does have a large majority of power, we say it is better than China having this power, because China has no respect for the international community. Thirdly, so they told us that they are not happy with the US authority in, uh, in the UN. But this, we say, is inherently false, because the U.S. does not have all the authority in the United Nations Security Council, which has many seats. China, Russia, England, France, all of these have veto powers as well. And even if it is true that the U.S. do have an incentive, it is a democratic incentive. It is far safer than inaccountable countries like China taking power upon their own hands. So let's bring this. I, in this debate, I would like to issue, deal with two questions. Hang on a moment. So my first point is what will happen if the US deprioritizes their power in the context of global powers? And secondly, in the context of countries where military intervention happens, what will be the effect? Yes, I'll take you. Okay. So why is it better that we actually don't develop international cooperation and international cooperation to be the global police? Why does it have to be the United States? Which is moving on, moving, moving on into, nicely into my argument about in the context of global powers, why we think it is detrimental that US power falls. So we say that there are several reasons for this. The opening side pointed out the first one, that the fact that China is governed by a one-party regime, and if the US does come back, uh, does decline in power, then the next obvious power is China. The opening government told us that Western ideology should not be imposed on others. But we say it is in fact the best, because it is only the US that has checks and balances. And furthermore, democracy does not mean imposing ideologies. No, only in necessity do we do so. So that is why how we successfully intervened in Libya when there was the necessity, when the people were consenting to this. But secondly, as, in, as extended in my partner's case, there is the issue of the power vacuum. We say that all, many countries are self-motivated and many countries work in their self-interest and they have particular interests to gain resources. We say it is particularly yeah. detrimental in this power vacuum. When the US steps down, then there will be power up to grabs, no sit down. We say that China particularly has incentives to abuse the power that the US does not in the present situation. And the way they do this is particularly harmful, we think, because they have no obligation to their own people, they have no obligation to accountability, and they have no obligation to human rights. We will not be able, if China does come, become the leading global community, then we will not be able to put a stop to this. They will be free to violate. And even now, it is being very harmful. And even now, it is very hard for the US to put a stop to the China's violations of human rights. This is, we say, is because specifically of the decline of the US power. And so we say that it is far more important for the US to reassert its authority to assure its its dominance so that China cannot violate people, uh, people's human rights in Tibet. But furthermore, we say that this will lead to a loss of deterrence because the US military currently is now the largest military in the world and it's bigger than the second militaries from the second largest to the fifth largest all combined, put together. We say this creates a large deterrence. Let's take an example. So before the US was the dominant power, so in World War I, before World War I, there were competing nations who were competing for different kinds of power. And they were competing, they were developing their own military techniques, their own warships, and they were trying to you know, 
uh, assert their authority. We say that it is best when one authority is far beyond the others so that the others beneath them will not strive for power. They will, this will decrease their incentives to try and seize power. So we say that the presence of US dominance stops this power vacuum because it is a democracy that respects, in a moment, discourse. It is a democracy that respects lots of opinions. And we will not allow for fighting over resources. At the end, Simon. So, if you like historical examples, there was also the Cold War with two dominant powers, one pushing its ideology on the other. Yes, precisely. That is why we don't think that the US should should deprioritize its global power, rather increase its global power, so it is the single dominant power, so that no one can oppose it, and so we don't have the Cold War again. So, no thank you, you've had your chance. So, the issue of, so in the context of countries, my second question I'll deal with, in the context of countries where military intervention does happen, and we affirm that democracies and dem democratic, liberal democratic ideals sometimes do go into countries and implant democracy. The government's stance is, as you told us, that yes, they should deal with it themselves. The case is that they simply can't. When Kony was taking these child soldiers, these child warriors had no help. In Syria, the government are oppressing people who have no way of fighting back. These innocent citizens cannot fight back. It is simply not possible for them to fight back. So when we do intervene, we say that much of the time there is a good reason to, to promote good values and furthermore because the people there desire it. Now, sometimes checks and balances do go wrong. This was the issue that Brian had to deal with, that no country is perfect. But Brian told us, as Brian told us, we have no better alternative. Simon then told us that China has a good cause for its um, keeping its uh, limiting its freedom of speech. But we say that China only understands itself and has little understanding for other countries for two reasons. Firstly, because it's inaccountable to anyone. There are no checks and balances. That is why it can openly abuse people in Tibet, which is completely unrelated to national security. And secondly, because it has a growing self-interest. It has to feed its huge economy and it has to keep up its consumption. That is why it is taking anti-diplomatic methods, asserting rights upon lands which are not theirs. They are asserting rights over Japanese islands to steal all their oil, which has not been approved of in the United Nations. China is taking all these illegitimate methods. So that is why, in the context, so that is why we don't think that China is an option. So, what have we told you? We have told you that single dominance is the only way we don't get another World War I, or World War II, or a Cold War. And we have told you that although the US is not perfect, it is far better than any other alternative available to us. So that is why we went to vote. I'd, I'd like to thank the debaters for what I'm sure everyone will agree with me was a really enjoyable debate. And invite the judges to start talking about it.